Wrestling is inherently weird. It's a sport which is a drama which is predetermined but physically knackering and the most powerful person in the industry doesn't know what a burrito is. It's one of those things that if you get it, you get it, but to outsiders it just doesn't make any sense. And honestly, can you blame them? One of the most revered wrestlers of all time is a near seven foot zombie undertaker who is also a satanic priest and a redneck biker and also some kind of dead cat. Cowboy. And let's not even get started on his brother. But even in this odd world of wrestling, some segments have stuck out for their unadulterated strangeness. Coming from left field, defying all convention, and usually asking us to leave logic at the door, they are equally celebrated and derided, and often leave people like Lance Storm and Jim Cornette turning a dark shade of purple. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic.com, and these are the 10 weirdest segments in wrestling history. But before we start, these are segments that are weird in comparison to their federations and surroundings. So there'll be no DDT Pro or Chikara or any other zany company in here because they are already bonkers from the ground up. Join us. Number 10, Ladina Debonair. The most recent entry on this list was one of the most divisive wrestling moments of 2020, and considering this was the year of the cinematic match, that is quite the accolade. As part of NJF's ongoing quest to infiltrate the inner circle and remould it in his image, he sat down for a steak dinner with the group's head honcho, Le Champion Chris Jericho. What we expected was one of the greatest of all time and the best talker of a generation to go back and forth, bickering, chatting, whatever they wanted. The last thing we expected was what we got. Out of nowhere, the two launched into a rendition of the Rat Pack classic Me and My Shadow, with MJF filling in for Sammy Davis Jr. and Jericho doing his best Sinatra impression. And they really gave it their all. Jabs at all the faces in AEW, backing dancers, tops and tails, Jericho turning bright red, it was a full-on Vegas extravaganza. Then, as soon as it finished, they resumed their dinner like nothing had happened. For a more sports-oriented product like AEW, this really felt out of the blue. In fact, it would have been more at home on something like Sesame Street. Actually, imagine that. Oscar the Grouch and NJF? Book it, Big Bird. Number 9. Mean Gene meets Andy Warhol. WWE and celebrity appearances go hand in hand as Vince McMahon and his sports entertainment behemoth will do everything in their power to get mainstream attention. As WWE started picking up steam in the mid-80s, it tapped into the zeitgeist and planted itself at the forefront of American entertainment. MTV got involved, as did Cyndi Lauper, and so too did Andy Warhol. Backstage at the water settled the score and you have the usual suspects like Lauper, Hulk Hogan, Mr. T and Captain Lou, all theatrically screaming bloody murder as a wig-sporting, winter-coat-wearing Warhol looked on. Naturally, Mean Gene Oakland wanted a few words with the pop artist. Warhol was far from bombastic as he slowly, unenthusiastically, and quietly said, It's so exciting, I just don't know what to say, when pressured about his feelings on the event. Turns out he'd walked into the wrong room and was never meant to be on television, so he and Mean Gene just ad-libbed. As a pioneer of pop art and at the forefront of the cutting edge and camp since the 60s, and a lifelong wrestling fan, it's no wonder that Warhol would want to get involved with WWE, but he stuck out like a sore thumb in this environment and the accidental segment was truly surreal. Number 8. Warrior is in the mirror the Ultimate Warrior's in-ring career was relatively short, but it was chock full of all sorts of mad crap. Bleeding black blood from under his hair when feuding with Papa Shango, his numerous rambling promos about skeleton armies and lightning and stuff, if it was odd and intense then odds are Warrior was all over it. Warrior's weirdest work occurred during his brief and rotten run in WCW that came about because Hollywood Hogan needed his win back, brother. For some reason, this WCW version of the Warrior was a kind of magical wrecking machine. He knocked out all of the NWO bar Hogan with his ostensibly supernatural smoke during the god-awful War Games match at Fall Brawl 98, but that wasn't even the weirdest part of his run. Hogan was paranoid, which is understandable considering Sting had sent him his own head in a box relatively recently, so Warrior started playing mind games with him, appearing in Hogan's dressing room mirror and terrifying the Hulkster as Eric Bischoff had no idea what was going on. Only Bischoff didn't see Warrior, as the commentators and the viewers at home could see the ultimate trickery, and this segment was undermined instantly, only making it weirder. Number 7. Vince and Shane Go to Church 
Vince McMahon likes to push the boundaries of taste and decency. It's made him billions of dollars and a legion of fans over the years, but the success quite clearly went to his head. Of course, Vince being Vince, his ego made him fearless and powerful. And after going after rivals, politicians, fellow billionaires, and the forces of Satan on WWE TV, there was only one opponent Vince needed to take on. God. In his feud with born-again Christian Shawn Michaels, Vince decided it was a perfect opportunity to pick a fight with an omniscient celestial being. Anyone else would have shied away from the idea, but not Vince. And in a quest to literally find God, he ended up in a church with Shane McMahon and had no idea what was going on. From spitting out holy water a la Triple H's entrance, criticizing God's work ethic, and reading aloud his own commandments to a clearly uncomfortable Shane McMahon talking about his dad's tanned body and own semen, this this was a demented segment that served only one purpose, to massage Vince's indestructible ego. How the heartbreak kid didn't have a temper tantrum about this is beyond me. Perhaps he really did change. Number 6. Little People's Court for all that Degeneration X is rightfully celebrated, we can't gloss over how terrible the 2009 reunion was. The shtick was old, the performers even older, and while the Attitude Era version was edgy and controversial, 2009 DX was tame and cheesy. And weird. Hornswoggle emerged as a DX superfan, but Trips and HBK were arseholes to him. Obviously, the two were soon summoned to Little People's Court to answer to their crimes. Now, if you haven't seen this, this next bit is going to sound like an extract from Alice in Wonderland. So, DX go under the ring, which instead of being a cramped, dirty crawl space is in fact a massive, sprawling mass of corridors like the TARDIS. They eventually end up in a courtroom which is completely inhabited by little people, including a judge, bailiff, and jury of seven. Oh, hang on. I just realized that was a Seven Dwarves joke. Bloody hell. Anyway, hijinks occurred because Vince McMahon thinks that little people are funny merely because they're little, DX got battered by everyone, and Hornswoggle somehow ended up joining the group. I have no words. This was just strange. It does have over 13 million views on YouTube, though. Might take some notes. Number 5. Rick Steiner vs Chucky Hooray! More WCW bollocks! Remember before when we talked about Halloween Havoc? That wonderful show in 1998 that featured the terrible Hogan vs. Warrior match? Well, obviously there were more matches on the card, including Rick Steiner and his brother Scott going one-on-one -on -one after Scott finally went berserk and joined the NWO. In the lead-up to Halloween Havoc, it was time for Mean Gene and the Dogface Gremlin to have a chat, only to be interrupted by a creepy cackle that had repeatedly rang out throughout Nitro. Who was it? A new rock Foster member? A new associate of Scott Steiner? Maybe some mind games from Sting? No, it was Chucky. You know, the demonic murderous doll that scarred a generation. Yeah, him. Chucky then proceeded to throw shade at Mean Gene and Rick Steiner, all in a lame way to promote the upcoming Bride of Chucky movie. But before he buggered off, he told Rick not to mess with Scott, as Big Popper Pump was the lead in Chucky's next movie. I mean, imagine that. That would be true horror. It wasn't the first time WCW blurred the lines between film fiction and reality, though. Number 5. Robocop Really, this list should be called 10 Mental Things WCW Did in the Quest to Be Number 1. Let me set the scene. Capital Combat 1990. Ric Flair was in the midst of another world title run, and the criminally underrated horseman lineup of Flair, Arn, Sid, and Barry Windham were making life difficult for Sting, Lex Luger, and all the other goodies. Flair was set to defend his title against Luger in a cage match in the main event, so to combat the influence of the four horsemen, Lex's mate Sting enlisted Robocop to help him keep order. You know, the fictional half-robot, half-man police officer from future Detroit that shoots people in the gonads. Everything about this was odd. Gordon Soley swallowing his pride to announce Robocop's arrival, complete with shaky cam and weird government types flanking him, Sting in his tiny vest getting locked in a tiny cage, Sid in a suit with flowing mullet shouting at Robocop. It was prime early 90s madness as wrestling went even more cartoony. The Robocop fad was weird in itself anyway. Kids loved Robocop, despite the first two films being in incredibly violent and disturbing. Still, at least this was a harmless one-off and didn't dominate WCW television for months. Number 3. The Dungeon of Doom 
This is kind of cheating, because the Dungeon of Doom storyline did dominate WCW TV for months, and is arguably the worst wrestling storyline ever. Or the best if you're very, very drunk, or are recovering from a head injury. But how do you pick just one strange segment from the Dungeon of Doom? Do you go for Hulk Hogan infiltrating their secret hideout and screaming that water is not hot? Do you prefer the debut of the Yeti, where what was quite clearly a giant mummy sauntered to the ring to awkwardly bum the Hulkster? How about a mustache? Marshless Hulk Hogan running around with a sword in a Zorro costume. The giant taking on Hogan in a monster truck jam before being pushed off a skyscraper, only to reappear unharmed later in the night. Or everything Ed Leslie did as the Zodiac. Barrel scraping performances all over the show. The Dungeon of Doom played out like a cross between a fever dream and a deleted Power Rangers episode. It was camp, corny, and ultimately rubbish. But as a snapshot of how bonkers wrestling went before the Attitude Era kicked in, you you cannot beat it. The weirdest part though, Hogan actually dropped the world title to the giant. The Hulkster doing the job? Bizarre. Number 2. Katie Vick no list about weird wrestling segments would be complete without mentioning Katie Vick now, would it? We've talked about it numerous times, but no matter how often we recount it, it doesn't get any less bizarre. So yeah, Triple H was at war with Kane, and in order to get into the big red machine's head, unearthed a dark secret from his past. You see, Kane once had a girlfriend called Katie Vick, and one night while driving drunk, Kane crashed his car and accidentally killed her. So far, so tasteless, and definitely not wrestling. Triple H went first further though, and showed footage from Katie's funeral, where Hunter in a cane mask climbed into a coffin containing a mannequin and fornicated with it. Even for 2002, this was rough stuff. It led to a ton of complaints and even some walkouts from WWE backstage staff. But overall, it was just so odd and so farcical. Bruce Pritchard has gone on to say that he's trying to blank Katie Vick from his memory, but if we have to live with that image of Triple H banging a dummy, then you should too, brother love. Number 1. Mae Young Gives Birth to a Hand the bad booking for 80% of Mark Henry's career is an odd yet often awe-inspiring thing. A huge beastly powerhouse of a man, you would think they would have pushed Mark as an unstoppable badass from day one, right? After coming in as a happy-go-lucky USA babyface and sinking like a brick, Henry had a brief moment of cool as a member of the Nation of Domination before morphing, melting I guess, into sexual chocolate. Now, for those unaware of sexual chocolate, let me sum him up for you. He liked making love. That was it. No nuance no growth, just pure hot loving. Eventually, Henry ended up getting involved with Pension and Mae Young because it was the Attitude Era and shocking pairings like this were its bread and butter. Obviously, Mae soon fell pregnant and a few weeks later went into labour, surrounded by fabulous Moolah, Pat Patterson, Gerald Briscoe and doting boyfriend Mark. Cue lots of farting, horrible creaking and squelching sounds before the miracle of birth occurred and the doctor was holding an afterbirth covered rubber hand. And turns out it was some long-winded joke about Henry's prowess as a love machine. But still, this was like a David Cronenberg movie without any of the class or philosophy. That said, I did question the meaning of life afterwards.